by normalizing your relations. You segregate logically related pieces of information into multiple tables. To maintain consistent data, the database has to enforce the referential integrity of these logical relationships between tables. For example, if student data resides in one table and enrollment information resides in another table, the database has to be able to ensure that every student ID in the enrollment table has a corresponding record in the student table. You define a relationship between two relations by creating an attribute or set of attributes, which is called a foreign key, in one relation, which contains values that match the values in the primary key of the other relation. For example, each row in the enrollment table has a foreign key column student ID, which contains a value that also exists in the primary key student ID column in the student table. You can allow foreign key columns to contain null values, but any non-null values have to match primary key values in the related table. And SQL Server can enforce several kinds of relationships, including one-to-many, many-to-many, and one-to-one. -one. A one-to-many relationship is based on matching the values in the primary key of one relation with the values in the corresponding foreign key of another relation. Each tuple in the first relation could potentially match many tuples in the second relation. For example, one student could be enrolled in many classes. The student enrollment relationship is a master-child or has a type of one-to-many relationship. One student has some number of class enrollments. A student might exist who has zero class enrollments, or one, or more, but every student enrollment maps back to exactly one student, and that's what's shown here in this figure. This type of relationship sometimes also represents containment. For example, an order contains many order details. In the case of the student enrollment, the student ID is the primary key of enrollment, but it doesn't comprise the entire primary key in that table. Class ID is also a foreign key in that table, and that makes up the other part of the primary key. Another type of one-to-many relationship is a lookup, or is a relationship. For example, each instructor is a member of a department in the school. The record in the department table with a value of domestic arts matches any number of records in the instructor table because that department has multiple instructors teaching its courses. But each instructor matches up with exactly one department. Each student can enroll in many classes, and many students can attend each class. This is called a many-to-many -many relationship, and you can represent it in the database only by using a third table. The enrollment table records the various pairings of students and classes. The primary key in the enrollment table is a composite key that contains unique combinations of student ID and class ID values. The word many, as used in database theory, is a bit of a misnomer. This applies both to one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships. It really means zero or more up to infinity. So multiple might be a better term to use. But many is the term widely used, so I'm going to stick with it here. In addition, consider that each course may be taught at different times during the week, taught by different instructors, and taught in different rooms. So the class table represents several many-to-many -many relationships between courses, instructors, and rooms. And those are all shown within this figure. Sometimes a foreign key can also be the entire primary key. This is called a one-to-one -one relationship, since each of the two relations can have only one record that matches. The most common use of one-to-one -one relationships is to define attributes that apply to only a subset of the tuples within a relation. For example, you might have a person table that holds general information about all people in the database, 
and an instructor table that holds extra information that applies only to faculty. So you can represent that. Each record in the person table might or might not have one matching record in the instructor table, but each record in the instructor table would have exactly one matching record in the person table. And that's how this relationship could be defined. In this case, instructor ID is both a primary key and a foreign key, because every instructor row has to have a matching person row. However, person ID is only a primary key and not a foreign key, because every person row doesn't have to match an instructor row. People might be students as well, or staff. One-to-one -one relationships, like the one for persons and instructors, can be used to represent object-oriented type hierarchies. In a middle-tier type library, person might be a base type and instructor a derived type that inherits from person. You can also use one-to-one -one relationships to partition a table for security so that you locate confidential data elsewhere and restrict access to that table. And you can also accomplish that sort of thing with views. Another reason to use this type of relationship is to partition the data for security so that the data resides in separate tables and is retrieved only when needed. Enforced relationships require that every foreign key value have a matching primary key value on the related table. In other words, the enrollment table can't contain a student ID that doesn't correspond to a matching student ID in the student table. Enforcing referential integrity also means that a student record can't be deleted while any enrollment records exist that depend on that student. In addition, you can't change a student ID value without making the same change to the student ID values in related enrollment records. But SQL Server and other industrial strength database engines optionally let you have the database server manage those relationships and keep them synchronized, even when you update or delete data. And this is called cascading updates and deletes. SQL Server allows you to enforce referential integrity through cascading updates and or deletes to related tables. So, for example, if you try to change a student ID value in the student table that was also used as a foreign key in the enrollment table, SQL Server can cascade the update, permitting the change in the student table and updating all related records in the enrollment table as well. Cascading deletes result from deleting a student as well as all related records in the enrollment table, leaving no orphans behind. Cascading deletes are potentially dangerous. Careless use of cascading deletes can easily wipe out all of your historical data. So be aware. Now, cascading updates handle the problem of changing primary key values because they automatically update related foreign keys in all related tables. You should never need to use this method if you use surrogate keys. But either way, you should always choose a primary key for its stability, one or more fields that will never change for that row. Cascading deletes also handle the problem of deleting related records in other tables so that the deletion doesn't violate any foreign key constraints. A cascading delete is potentially very dangerous, as I mentioned, mainly because it could mean the loss of historical data related to the main deleted record. For example, what are the implications of enabling cascading deletes between the customers and orders table? You delete all orders for deleted customer, presumably at least some orders that have long since been fulfilled. If you delete an order in the orders table, all order details will be gone as well. So you have to carefully think through how SQL Server is going to implement cascading updates and deletes. In SQL Server 2005, Microsoft added the option to specify that updates or deletes of a primary key set related foreign keys to null or to their default values. This doesn't make much sense for updates, 
but it makes a lot of sense for deletes when the foreign key allows nulls or has a default value. When the relationship is a parent-child relationship of containment, a cascading delete is often appropriate. If you delete an order, you probably want to use the cascade option to delete its order details. However, for lookup relationships, you can use the set null or set default option to leave the related record intact. For example, if you delete a department, you probably want to leave the instructors in that department intact. You can have their department assignment set to null or to a default all-purpose department and then fill in the correct new department assignments later. You specify cascade options when you define foreign key constraints. The new options in SQL Server 2005 match similar capabilities that exist for the foreign key constraints of data table objects within ADO.NET, if you're a .NET programmer. Even with fully normalized tables and well-enforced referential integrity, garbage can creep into your database in plenty of other ways. You can't prevent all data entry errors, but you can do a lot at the database level to increase the chances that invalid data will be rejected. Relational theorists have formulated distinct categories of integrity. For example, the uniqueness of each tuple in a relation is generally considered to be a form of entity integrity. The restriction that a particular attribute can contain only dates is an example of enforcing domain integrity. And the creation of relationships between primary and foreign keys enforces referential integrity. However, these distinctions between different types of data integrity are not as simple as they appear. Since entity integrity and referential integrity can be considered forms of domain integrity. Domain integrity is the restriction of attributes to a defined domain of valid values. When you select a data type for a column, you restrict the domain of values that can be stored in that column to dates or strings or logical values or whatever. When you select whether to permit nulls, you refine the definition of the domain. Designating a primary key or a unique index can also be considered restricting the domain to values to prevent duplicate key values. Even the creation of relationships can be seen as restricting the domain of non-null foreign key values to values that exist in the corresponding primary key in the related table. So in a sense, all forms of data integrity are variations on the basic concept of domain integrity. Some types of data integrity are referred to as business rules. For example, you may want to restrict the domain of school class dates to include only dates that fall on weekdays. Or you may need to run a procedural test to determine the domain of acceptable class assignments for a student based on the number of credits needed for graduation. SQL Server includes a rich set of tools for defining and enforcing these kinds of business rules. But some programmers prefer to define only the most basic forms of data integrity within the database and then enforce the more complex and changeable business rules in code that resides outside the database within an application. To enforce these rules, you have to always use external code to make changes to the affected objects in the database. For example, where do you put a business rule that says a delivery date has to be later than the order date? The answer depends on the application needs and how you design the architecture of the application and database.